Hello, good morning. You are very welcome along to Ireland AM. It is Tuesday, the 20th of June. And do you know what? We've got loads in store across the morning from GAA protests to beauty bosses and doggy diets. You name it. <laughs> We've got it. Sure do. Yeah, we do. First up, uh, following a statement put out by the ladies' GAA panels mm -hmm. calling for better conditions in the sport, Dublin Camogie player Ashley Maher opens up on what it's really like for women playing at senior level. We're going to talk to her very shortly. Yeah, and if you are a parent, the children's summer break, it's either already here or fast approaching. We're going to be discussing whether or not school holidays are too long. Because, of course, they were all around the farming calendar before because the kids had to help. Yeah, well, exactly, but the kids can't really help now. They're can't not really, really helping anymore. They're not at work. three months. What do you think, lads? 0896 triple one triple one. Do you want to take away those teachers' holidays? Pretty good, the childcare, honestly. Yeah, uh, get in touch with us. We'd love to hear, you, uh, hear your thoughts on that. Now, she's a beauty boss and later entrepreneur, Pamela Laird talks battling imposter so, uh, syndrome in the boardroom. Plus, if you're prone to pampering your pooch, stay tuned because we'll be dissecting your doggy's diet and whether they're overindulging. That's, I feed from the table. All dogs from the table. People Desperate. kill me. My dog, poor dog. Uh, Derek is at the races this morning. He's at the current in Kildare. What's in store, Derek? Yes, good morning. Uh, giddy up, guys. We're live down here in County Kildare. What a day we had. Yes, they have plenty of fundry down, pours bucketing down in some places, and it looks like more of the same on the currents for today, feeding up from the set. But we've landed here on the hallowed turf here in the Curra in County Kildare, the Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby, kicking off here on Sunday, the 2nd of July. So we're going to be taking you on a tour of the grounds. We're going to be mucking out with some of the crew, and hopefully, we're going to be giving a simulator a spin. So giddy up, Tabby. Giddy up, oh, words. Yes. Tabby, I believe your mum is from this neck of the woods, is she? She is, yeah, my mum <laughs> is not far road. from there. I think actually my cousin has a coffee shop there. I'll put you in touch with them, Derek. Okay, good man. Get, <laughs> get you a coffee right as well. We all need it. <laughs> uh, it's great stuff, Derek. We'll catch up with you later on in he's, the show. He's going to be on a horse simulator. And yes. he's going to be in his chaps. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be so good. Time to get the news now. Over to you, Ashley Roach. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. US and Canadian search teams are racing against time to find a tourist submarine that went missing during a dive to the Titanic's wreck on Sunday. It's believed five people were on board when contact with the small sub was lost around an hour and a half into the dive. The rescue operation is continuing in the mid-Atlantic, but there has been no sign of the vessel so far. A British explorer is understood to be among the crew on board. Very difficult operation. Um, the actual nature of the seabed uh, is uh, uh, very undulating. Titanic herself lies uh, in, in a trench. There's lots of debris around. Uh, so trying to differentiate with sonar in particular uh, and trying to target the area you want to search in uh, with another submersible is going to be very difficult indeed. Um, the only sort of uh, hope I think one has is that the mothership will have a standby craft uh, that can actually go down and investigate immediately and see what's going on. Diving is very dangerous, but it is, uh, it's high tech, you know, and as each year goes by, the equipment gets better, the technology gets better and so on. So uh, I'm very hopeful and very positive. I, I mean, uh, I was in the sub for uh, 12 hours. We have our own breathing system on board. And if that's maintained properly, like changing your uh, filter and your CO2 scrubber, you can stay down there for, you know, quite a few hours. Gardaí are to begin buying body-worn cameras with new laws on the way to allow them to be used for facial recognition technology. However, in a cabinet compromise, facial recognition won't work in real time and will only be used to check existing images already held by Gardaí. The compromise comes after the Green Party blocked Fine Gael's plans to allow the use of fa facial recognition in real time. Retained firefighters last night called off all-out strike action due to take place today in their industrial action over pay and conditions. The last-minute decision came after seven hours of talks at the Labour Court. 2,000 firefighters at 200 stations were due to strike from midnight, but that has now been cancelled pending a full Labour Court hearing next Monday morning. Well, we don't know what's on the table at the moment, but we do know that the court is satisfied that it's going to be able to be of assistance to the parties. And we have to accept the court's judgment in that regard and come back next week uh, to have a more specific engagement about money and terms and everything else that is um, part of our dispute. 
Ukraine will not be formally invited to join NATO's military alliance in the Lithuanian capital next month. According to the NATO chief, consultations are ongoing regarding Ukraine's bid to join NATO. He also said that member states must agree when the time is right. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has been seeking a time frame for when that will be possible. In India, some densely populated regions are in the grips of a heat wave. It's understood 170 people have died. The scorching heat wave has overwhelmed hospitals and disrupted power supply. Hospitals in India are overwhelmed with patients in recent days. At least 170 people have died during a sweltering heat wave in the Bihar and Uttar Pradesh provinces in the northeast of the country. Some officials are denying the deaths were directly caused by the heat. The states are two of the country's most populous and they've seen temperatures soar over 43 degrees Celsius. Routine power outages are adding to challenges across the states. The largest hospital in the district is unable to accommodate more patients, with hospital morgues also at capacity. While northern regions of India are known for sweltering heat during the summer months, temperatures have been consistently above normal, according to India's meteorological department. As the heat wave continues in some regions, other parts of India are now also dealing with floods following recent heavy rain. Marie Malkahi, Virgin Media News. Now it's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We're starting with the Irish Times. It's headline, Contractors pause work at Children's Hospital. The lead contractor on the National Children's Hospital has been told to stop key building work on half of the facility's operating theatres and it claims that a fresh setback could cost tens of millions. Warning of Irish fruit and vegetable shortage. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Growers and independent, or industry specialists have warned of shortages of Irish grown produce for the rest of the year due to months of heavy rain followed by drought. The Herald similarly goes with shoppers face thin end of the veg. Industry specialists have warned the shortage will include the likes of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli and carrots. The examiner leads with crack cocaine cases rise sevenfold. People are now being tr treated for crack cocaine in every county with treatment for cocaine powder use, use having more than trebled in the last six years. Five are trapped inside Titanic submarine with air running out is the top story on the Daily Mail. A desperate search is underway for British billionaire Hamish Harding and his four companions after contact was lost with their submarine as it was visiting the shipwreck of the Titanic. The Sun also covers that story with five loss on sub to Titanic. The Mirror's front page, Fury over Dermot K. Slur word. The Star leads with Fury at Fanning Christie rant. RT has received over 40 complaints over Dave Fanning's inappropriate remarks a day after Christie Dignam's death. Now, coming up next, the ladies' senior camogie and football panels say they will play the rest of the championship under protest in a bid to secure better conditions for the players. After the break, we'll be discussing inequality in the GAA and what needs to be done to level the playing field. We'll see you back here very shortly. Good morning, you're very welcome back. Now, the ladies senior inter-county camogie and football panels have said they will play the remainder of the 2023 championship under protest in a move to secure improved conditions for female GAA players. Here to discuss this are journalist and former Kildare camogie player Sinead O'Carroll and Dublin camogie player Ashley Mayer. Thank you both so much for being morning. here. A lot was said yesterday, Sinead, about uh, the players just looking for an improvement in conditions and they're going to play the rest of the season under protest. What does that exactly mean and what's it all about? So there's a few things going on at once because obviously there are a lot of teams and there's a lot of uh, disparity between how those teams are treated. But across the board, uh, female teams within the GA umbrella, so there, yes, there's three organisations. The three organisations are speaking about integrating under the one GA umbrella. But in the meantime, there's a big difference between how those teams are being treated within ladies football and camogie and then in, in, in the bri broader circle. So there's one main thing that the, the teams are asking for is to have a charter of minimum standards drawn up. So what does that look like? Things like making sure that there's access to pitches and dressing rooms in a fashion that allows people to plan their days and their weeks, that there's meals, hot meals after training, that there is a certain level of travel expenses so people can afford to get to yeah. uh, training and matches. Uh, there's access 
access to doctors and physios, these things that aren't happening. Only, I think, less than 50% of teams have access to a physio at the moment. What does that look like in practicality? You get injured at training and you, you sit there with a, a, a knee ballooning up and no one telling you what to do, no one with an ice pack, no one with any kind of pain control. What does it look like then when you have to figure out how to get to hospital, how to get to an x-ray? Um, so all these very practical things. You finish training. One of the things, if Tommy, you'll obviously know this, one of the things that after training, you're, you know, you're meant to have a hot shower straight away and you're meant to eat food as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. If you're in a situation where there's no hot food provided to you and you've no hot shower and you have to get into your car, then you're kind of deciding, OK, which is more important? Do I get home? Do I jump, jump in the shower? Do I yeah. eat food first? And then so nothing is optimising your performance. And that's the stuff that girls so, like Ashley are meant to be worried about. I, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous when you hear all the time about the women's game is growing and it's yeah. brilliant. We're getting the crowds in and everybody's loving it. And we want to get encourage more young girls to take part in the sports. So when you hear this, it's very, very frustrating. But actually, what, explain to me what under protest, you're still playing championship matches, but under protest, what does that mean? Yeah, so I suppose the thing is, like, from our perspective, everybody wants to be playing, nobody wants to be pulling out of games. You know, we spend so much time, energy, effort, commitment to be training. We get to championship season, the last thing we want to be doing is pulling out from games or disrupting the championship in any way. So we're hoping that it won't get to the stage where we have to do that. But I guess we really want to highlight that we aren't happy with the circumstances as they are and we cannot continue to play championship after championship endlessly waiting for integration under these circumstances. So if we feel that we're not being listened to, if we can't get the Camogie mm. Association, the LGFA and the GAA to sit down and have meaningful conversations about how we're going to improve um, circumstances, then we will elevate that protest. And these are minimum standards that sort of players, you know, junior intermediate teams on, on the men's side, I think they have them, right? And if you're in a county like Limerick after training, you're kind of handy. You're, you'll get home fairly handy afterwards. But if you're in a place like Cork, or Galway, you could be travelling for hours and hours. This is sort of following on from what the women had to do in rugby and football. Yeah. So yeah. You're, it's kind of the same thing. They had to, you know, ask for tracksuits for a place to be able to change before and after matches. It's kind of going, Harriet, we're here, we're elite athletes. Yeah, unfortunately, it is something that we have seen across a number of sports that, you know, female players just seem to be getting that lesser treatment consistently than the men. Um, and it is something that we've seen, I suppose, as a collective that unfortunately, sometimes you, it does escalate to this point where you have to bring it to media and you have to kind of attract attention to show just how bad the situation is before you see improvements. Um, and they are exactly the kind of things that you're talking about that we are seeing. You know, it's not that we're, it's not that we're looking to be professional athletes or looking to be paid. Um, unfortunately, we've got to a point where we are seeing girls are reporting from other counties that they've got to a point where players are literally stepping away from panels because they can't afford to put petrol or diesel in a car to drive you know, home from college in Dublin down to training in Cork to, to go to training. And, you know, that shouldn't be the circumstances. Yeah. If you're good enough to play senior into county, you know, you should be able to... Play mm, we should. were here a few weeks ago talking about Kildare. Kildare got pulled out of their championship by, by their own county yes. board. Um, and one of the things that the Kildare team said in their statement was, we're not looking for equality. We can't dream of equality yet. We're so far away that we're looking for minimum standards. So I think that's a really important point that I should say. They're not looking to get paid. They're not looking for to be treated like the Limerick hurlers are being treated or the Kilkenny hurlers are treated because we're so far away from that, especially in certain counties. The certain counties, they, they should be striving for that equality because they can get closer, but this disparity is huge. So it's a minimum standard <laughs> that the girls are looking for. So, you know, people might be sitting at home and, you know, I see the, the comments on the internet being like, you know, until the, the women get the crowds that men do, they can't be asking for this stuff. Minimum standards. That is what we're asking for, so that that's what the, the women are asking for, so that they can continue to build the game and well, that they can make it viable for the, the women who are coming up behind the future. them. So again, like what the Kildare player said, if we don't speak out now, like we're, we're leaving yep. a bad situation. So it's really brave and it's really important and it's really complicated. So mm. <laughs> it's a really tough well, thing to be doing when they should be just training. And ask and you on matches. that about integrating the sport to the LGFA, the GA and the Camogie Association as well. So they're not integrated at the moment? No, no. so obviously GA was set up f as, a, as a men's organisation, yeah. mm -hmm. as, a, as a men's sport. And Which then I thought Camogie, was the umbrella everything was under that then, no. No, so they're, they're affiliated so, and um, within the club structure, so this is how it gets complicated, Tommy, okay. within the club structure, there's a one club model. So a lot of clubs, um, we hope, we were talking about this earlier, we hope the vast majority of clubs are one club. So if you join your local, so I join my local Selbridge GA, you're a member of Selbridge GA, it doesn't 
doesn't matter if you play camogie football yeah. or and then your the standards have to be set across the board so you know you have access to the same pitches you have access to the same dressing rooms you're you're treated as equals that works incredibly well in most clubs in my club I am have always been and and will always be treated at the exact same as a senior or an intermediate yeah. uh, male player that doesn't happen in the county. There's no one county model. So that's wh that's where it becomes different then. So people who might just play club will say, oh, well, you know, we're treated the same. But in the county model, it the, the yeah. three organisations are completely different. The integration is going to be difficult because there's obviously to try and integrate three bodies into one to make sure that, you know, football and camogie, ladies football and camogie isn't treated like the second and third sport, mm. third and fourth sport. You don't want to go in and then be treated like the third and fourth sport. So they have to make sure that it's built on equality, which is the statement yeah. that they've all said, that it will be built on equality. And there's complication then, obviously, there's a lot of board positions, there's a lot of executive positions that need to be figured out. And then all the county boards have to come on board with it so yeah. it's not a simple process so it does okay. make sense that something has to happen while that process goes on. Ashing, I'm just wondering because I just think we've seen the game explode in the last decade both camogie and women's football mm -hmm. and certainly from the point of view you know the argument is that the women are playing football in a way that the men used to play we haven't seen that in like a decade and and, and it's such a great spectacle. What is the support like from your male counterparts? Because you do need it. Yeah, no, the support has been brilliant from our male counterparts, to be fair. We amalgamated the WGPA and the GPA, which was effectively the female and the male kind of unions. Yeah. Um, there nearly two years ago, it would be two years in December. And I think when the vote happened, it was like 98% of the women voted to amalgamate and 99% of the males voted to amalgamate. And that's them knowing that their resources are being shared. And what I think we have to remember is that the males aren't professional players either. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though all of the revenue from the GAA goes into the male salaries and we're looking to now take half of that. That's not the case. You know, I think it's 5% of the turnover of the GAA covers male expenses. The rest of it is there and is available and is being allocated to other things. So, you know, it would be more than enough available for us to just get a small percentage of that yeah, to cover well, our and, you, and you see the, the profits that the GAA are making. Listen, if your requests aren't heard, yeah. what will you do? Look, I think we've seen the example set by male players. Obviously, as I said, we don't want to protest. We want to play games. We want the championship to go ahead smoothly. But, but we've if seen, it gets that stage. Yeah, look, we've seen them do things, delaying the start time of official games by 20 minutes, refusing to do media, you know, covering uh, logos of GAA or Camogie or whatever it might be on shirts. Obviously, we don't want to get to that point. But if we have to act, we will because the time is now. Um, listen, it's been thank you so much for coming in and yeah. for telling us what is going on. If you're, you know, involved in the sport, what do you make of all this? 0896 triple one triple one. Not even asking minimum for equality, standards. asking for minimum standards. Ashing Mara Dublin, uh, Camogie captain, thank you so much. And Sinead O'Carroll, you're going to be sticking around with us. Uh, we're going to be chatting news in just a little while. And uh, still to come this hour, we'll be discussing whether or not the school holidays are too long <laughs> and should they be cut short. He wants childcare. That's what, he thinks, that's what he Think thinks teachers the are there parents. for. Childcare. No, the students are done. You have them, you mind their, them. Dropping their Not course next this morning. Plus, we're going to be unpacking the top news stories, hitting the headlines. Stay with us. Hello, sorry. You're very welcome back. Secondary school students across the country are now kicking back to enjoy an extra long summer after another busy school year. Very busy school year. Breaks are important. It's all about wellness. But how long is too long? We want to talk to you today. Do you think that school holidays are too long? You can text us or you Secondary can... Secondary school now. Secondary school. You can text us uh, 0896 or we're going to put up a poll on screen and you can just scan the QR code and let us know what you think. Joining us to discuss the length of school holidays is teacher and journalist Jennifer Horgan alongside Principal of St. Aidan's Community School in Tala, Kevin Shortall. Thank you both so much for being here. Be this good. is something that has been discussed for years. It comes up every once in a while and you recently, Jennifer, wrote an article about the length of uh, the school year what do you make of it is it too is it too short is it too short yes in secondary school i think it is yeah for a variety of reasons i'm going to be really popular with my students <laughs> and my fellow teachers um but yeah i think we should be in line with primary um i think eight weeks is enough i think it's hard to defend 12 weeks that extra stretch for lots of reasons I mean, it's, it's interesting as a teacher even saying this as well. Like, what yeah. benefits do you think that the students and teachers and parents of those students 
could get from a shorter summer holiday, say eight weeks, as opposed to, say, the three months? Well, one of the great things will be that your third years and sixth years will be in exams, right? So they'd be taken off your hands. They'd be doing their state exams. Mm -hmm. So you'd actually have a lot of free time on your timetable. Um, so during the, what, what would be your, your class time with those year groups, you'd have time to plan, maybe collaborate with your department. Um, it would be, it could be, a, you know, a very productive month for teachers. Um, I think that our year is packed. I think that we have actually really high contact time, even though we have a, a shorter academic year. So I'd like to slow it down a little bit. You mentioned wellness, um, you know, so I think, I think that we could just slow down the pace a little bit during the year, extend the year. Um, and yeah, I mean, as I say, I don't think students would initially be too pleased with the idea. But I think, you our know... Our teachers. I know. Our teachers, yeah. <laughs> but, this is, you know, obviously a school calendar in Ireland years ago was set up around a sort of an agrarian calendar. An awful lot of children had to work on the farm during the summer to get out there, do the hay baling, all that kind of stuff. That's a very, very, very long time ago, Kevin. Do you think that we need to shorten those school holidays for sector school students to eight weeks from 12? Uh, I suppose I'm speaking now as a, a teacher, a school principal and a parent. Yeah. And I have a daughter doing her leaving cert right now in school. Hi, Louise, we're really proud of you. Um, best of luck. Best of luck. Oh, she's, she's doing great, thank God. But um, you, we're making an assumption that the, the school exams, it's just a couple of hundred students in a school hall. But our school has about 25 special centres right the way through the school for students who have a, an additional reader or whatever. So the school is not a place where we could have everybody else in right now. And that's a good thing in a way, because what we're doing is we're putting a huge amount of resources into making the exams as comprehensive and as fair for everybody. Yeah. So if we were to have so you exams... You couldn't accommodate. You couldn't accommodate, you couldn't accommodate people, having classes There's an assumption that. as well that there's only a couple of people involved. There's thousands of school staff right the way through the country, traveling around the country, running these exams at the moment. Mm. It's very complicated, so it, it, it sounds easy, but it isn't easy to do something along with the exams. They're, they're, they're getting more complicated all the time, and that's a good thing, because we're, what we're doing what is we're making them more comprehensive. How do other countries do it then? What do you mean? How Other do they... countries that have an eight-week period where they run the exams at the same time as the final month of the school. Mm. Well, there are different forms of assessment around the world. Yeah. yeah. So, again, error, it's a little bit like training for, a, a, let's say, a boxing match. We've kind of found a sweet spot here in Ireland where we, we, we run our programme right up to the end. But, uh, and we've, Jennifer... we've, done it, we've, we've done it over years and years and years and found that kind of that way of doing things. So I'm not saying it's the be-all and end-all, but that's the way we do it here. But Jennifer did say there that the school year and the academic year is packed. Mm -hmm. I think we have been hearing that for a very long time. There is stress on teachers to try to get that curriculum finished every single year. Mm -hmm. So from your point of view, you're like, if we could just give people that extra few weeks rather than overwhelming everyone, right? Yeah, and I actually, very interesting uh, what Kevin's saying there about um, space and facilities. And I think underlying the Irish education system is a lack of funding. And that's what we're coming up against. So I think you're right, Kevin. I think most schools, my school couldn't do it, couldn't mm. have kids in because we don't have a school. Yeah. We're waiting seven years oh. for a school. Mm. So I suppose I am speaking very aspirationally, mm. but I think for th the well-being of young students, like 12, I have a near 13 year old at home. It is so hard to keep him off the screen. I'm sorry, I'm sure there are plenty of parents yeah. who, will, who will relate. And actually, three months, it's a tough, it's, it's a real challenge. You know, now I'm lucky because I'm a teacher, so I'm off. Yeah. So I can be there for him. But two parents working, a 12, 13, 14-year-old at home, I would be worried for their, their, their well-being. It would be so easy, of course, when they're home and they don't maybe have somebody there constantly watching them. It's so easy to just let them go to the room and go on their computers. And it's well-being, that, like, and the, the mental health side of things in school is so, so important now. Mm. And whenever you're talking about the packed calendar, mm. teachers are struggling to give students mm. that individual attention all the time. Mm. You know, is there something to say that a stretched out uh, school year might give a bit more personal attention? Yes, but I think that the tension to get the curriculum done is a curricular problem rather than a time problem. Okay. So in other words, 
students learn at a different pace, but when you differentiate, when you're trying to bring everybody along, like years ago, they'd say, the teachers say, I taught to, so one person got an A, and therefore I taught to that level. Whereas that's not the point of what we do anymore. It's about getting everybody to a place where they experience success. And that's not about the time. I mean, around the world now, we're looking at models where people are going to a four day week and productivity is going up. Yeah. So more time doesn't mean better results and okay. better results doesn't mean better quality. You yeah. know, we're looking at well-being, so we're looking at a situation where students experience success, and that's the most important thing. And bringing them in for longer or doing more doesn't mean that will happen. And that is very interesting, and we are teaching in a different way, and we don't want it to be rote learning as it mm. was for so long, that you can just regurgitate facts on a page without understanding anything. But Jennifer, I'm just wondering, because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, being a teacher was a really attractive job. You know, you could afford to have a family, you could afford to get a mortgage, you could afford to have a life, go on holidays. Not anymore. Like, we all know mm -hmm. that there are serious issues with what's going on with affordability in this country. But one of the big perks to get people into teaching is going, how are you? There's your three months in the summer now. Enjoy yourself. That's your perk. That's, it do you a see an issue going, we're taking those four weeks away? It oh, would yeah. cause an issue with It would cause people. an issue. But I would say as a teacher myself, and I think it's true of a lot of teachers, it's not the 12-week holiday. And I think that actually the day-to-day -day experience of being a teacher in overpopulated classrooms in poor facilities, if we were to work on that and actually work on investment, I don't think in the long run teachers would mind. I know that's a big thing, but I honestly think that if the conditions of our work were better, we wouldn't be running out the door so eagerly at the end of May. And I also would say in terms of, uh, I agree with you, Kevin, what you're saying, it's not about the time, but we have to acknowledge that the three months of the summer holidays are very different depending on your situation as a young person. Mm. So three months is a very long time to leave certain kids um, you know, outside of the system. Mm. And schools are wonderfully uh, supportive places with people who know what they're doing, who know children better than anyone. Um, and yeah, my three months, if I'm from a, a well-to-do family, I might be off to the Gwail Tucks, I might be doing sport courses, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I'll be reading every day, my parents will be encouraging me. That's not the case for a lot of children in Ireland. So I think we have to acknowledge how important our schools are. We need to fund them better and we need to have professionals in schools also. Far more funding in terms of our social supports. Yeah. Absolutely, because I remember those holidays were spent going to camps and going to all sorts. But of course, in the, these times, it's hard for a lot of families yeah. to afford them for Completely. that. Listen, Kevin, fine. Like, do you think this could ever happen? Do you think anything like a, a change up, a real radical change in the system could ever happen? I believe in debate. I believe in change. And I believe that everything, that, all the problems that we're encountering exist. But a simple situation of lengthening the school year doesn't necessarily do that. But in terms of the reform that we need to enhance well-being, to make sure that there's continuity, to look after those vulnerable students during the summer, that's happening in a lot of schools. Okay. And we just need to understand that more. I know, and but as you say, there's such diversity in, mm. on the care around mm. the country. Jennifer, can I just say, well done to you. Fair play for doing this. Know, Let's be nice to Jennifer, everybody. Can I just the say, pit with that one. It's uh, so nice. You'd be able to do that before Twitter. You could actually have an opinion. Fair oh, play great, to you. Yeah. It's yeah. great to actually hear it. And Kevin as well. Jennifer Horgan, teacher and freelance journalist. And Kevin uh, Shortall, principal of St. Aidan's Community you. School in Tala. And best of luck to your daughter as well. Thanks so much. Uh, We'd love to get your opinion on this as well. 0896 yeah. one and you see the little thing there. Where are we sitting at? 61% 61, 61 of people say that say they're no, not. It's yeah. not too long. We'll see. 0896. Oh, change that. Triple one, <laughs> triple one. Whether you are a parent, a student, or a teacher, we would love to hear from you this morning. Absolutely Cheers. right. Coming up next, we're going to be looking at all, all this morning's papers. We'll see you back here very shortly. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Now, crack cocaine cases, they have risen sevenfold. And of course, the Titanic submarine missing with five on board and it is, it would appear, running out of air. Sinead O'Carroll, editor with The Journal, has stayed with us. Good morning to you, Sinead. Hi, how are you? Again, um, yep. listen, let's make this story. It's front of the examiner, I think it's in The Times as well, about crack cocaine. So crack cocaine, that's a combination of cocaine powder and crack. 
Yeah, um, so probably people are familiar with crack cocaine from a lot of TV, TV shows. TV shows, um, yeah. In the US, there's a huge crack cocaine problem in the, the US. The wire. Yeah, you know? and it, it's, it's looking like it's, you know, becoming a bit more prevalent here than it had been. Um, it's across the, the health uh, research board, board put out this um, drugs survey every year to show what people are being treated for across facilities in Ireland. Um, and crack cocaine is now in every county according to the at least the treatment of people who are wow. uh, using it. Cocaine has also overtaken opiates. Um, yeah. So um, there's a huge amount of uh, people being treated for, for cocaine uh, addiction and, and use. So there's two things driving that. Uh, one is obviously the prevalence and the use of cocaine, but also that treatments are available um, for it. So there is a there is a more optimistic part of it there that actually more people are being treated mm. because there is more treatment available to them. Um, and yeah, so it gives us a snapshot of what, what drug use and what treatment is being uh, used across the country. One of the statistics I picked out, 72% of uh, people being treated for, for it are men. So it is. It's very. Yeah. There's. There's not a balance there. It's. Yeah. A, it's a, a big disparity between uh, uh, men and women. And yeah, cocaine overtaking opiates is, is a big one too. Professor Colin O'Gara, he's clinical lead of addiction services at St John of God Hospital. Uh, he was talking. I think it was back in March, and he was saying that the cocaine issue is particularly prevalent now. You think of it as an urban issue, and he was like, no, no, it's huge issue with farmers and men in their 50s and 60s. So while we think we might know what it is, you know, young people going out because you can't afford a drink and cocaine is so cheap now. Apparently it's just so ridiculously cheap. But the age profile of people that use it, it's is, all over the place. And yeah, well, and that's when you see the, the like, one in three of the 12,000 cases treated for problem drug use were cocaine. So they're, they're very, very big figures. So you are going to see it across demographics, uh, across age yeah. groups. Um, but there is that, you know, there is a 25 to 34 year old. There, it is very prevalent in, in that group, it, particularly with men. It does say the vast majority of crack cocaine, though, is all in Dublin. It's actually quadrupled cracking, yeah. from 500 to 2,000, which yeah. is quite Yeah, the cases insane, are kind so. of in, yeah. in double or single figures. In other counties where it's up to 750 and again Massive. that's people being treated so there's a lot of people using crack cocaine who aren't being treated so that's another kind of layer of the issue as well but even just the like the i remember i was walking up a street in dublin and it was a burger joint and there were three lads in the window and they were all having cocaine with their burgers i was like and there's just it's not hidden no, it's, it's, it's not, not hidden anymore. And like what you were saying about the young lads and the drink thing, that is that is one of the reasons that people are, you know, taking cocaine instead of taking alcohol because, you know, you cost the cost and also the idea of wellness and it being mm -hmm. better for your body than alcohol is. Yeah. Um, so that's been a big change. I think, you know, the, the stats from 2016 is like an explosion in con cocaine use, like, is, is huge. Again, we'd love to hear from you at home on this. Uh, you know, are you seeing the rise in this? Like yeah. Warren's saying, you're seeing it actually openly being you know, used on the streets. Yeah. We'd love to know 896 111 Now, there's another big story. It's front of the a lot of the papers this morning is top of the news as well about this submersible carrying five people to try and see the Titanic. Yeah, there's kind of been global wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this because Ocean Gate Expeditions had been hoping to put this submissible vessel down to go into the Titanic uh, wreckage and explore. And they had five people who um, had decided to, to go with them. There was a, a very brief weather window that one of the men who was going on the expedition said yeah. so that they could go down and do the diving uh, expedition, but they lost uh, contact with the submissible um, very quickly into, into the journey. They have 96 hours from when that happened to, to wow. for, for them to, to find them. So it's a real race against the clock. We think we're at the end of um, that. That was um, grim. And from reports, there probably was a ping um, near the Titanic wreckage, but okay. um, the Titanic wreckage itself took a long, long time to find, and that was yes. the size of the Titanic. Yeah. This is a much smaller submersible that fitted just fitted five people with about the space of a van. Um, so it is a, and, it's and they a, paid it's a terrifying story. Two hundred thousand pounds a head. Yeah, obviously this. it's not a cheap exposition, and it's it's kind of one of these, uh, you know 
people who really wanted to, that the CEO of the submissible of Ocean Gate is on there, a couple of, you know, diving uh, aficionados, people who really wanted to go and see yeah. it. And obviously it's not a cheap mission. So 200,000. Um, and I think the dangers were, were very much, uh, they were very yes, much we aware of the dangers backwards. and it's yeah. incredibly far down the in the deep, deep sea. So very, very scary. Hopefully something can be done. And real quickly, you're great for taking a nap, aren't you? You can Love go to sleep nap. like that. Love a nap. Love, I've seen him fall asleep probably during an ad break. Probably explains here. This, uh, this headline. <laughs> this headline, a nap a day could keep a memory loss at bay. His memory is top notch, <laughs> yeah. to be fair. What's, what's actually, your brain is just getting... It's just getting too big. It's actually, just getting tonight. bigger and bigger. I just you can't know? cope with all these statistics <laughs> in my head. Our brains Thanks shrink. Naps. Our brains tr shrink, but if you take a nap, you could get rid of your senior moments, that's what it's saying. So there we go. Listen, we'd love to, to take a nap. We have to go 0896 triple one triple one nap a day. That's him. Uh, Sinead O'Carroll from the Journal. Donny, as always, great to have you with us. We have plenty Thanks, more Sinead. coming up still here on Ireland. Um, don't be going for that nap just yet. We'll see you back here shortly. <laughs> take one today now. Welcome back to Tuesday's Ireland AM. Coming up shortly, we're going to be discussing public harassment and how we react to it and what someone can do as a bystander. Uh, the, because there's fight and flight, that's what it, you thought it was. Yeah. And so then there's actually five Fs now, I think, Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. Fight, mm. flight, freeze, fawn. There's loads of different things uh, that you can react in a certain way if someone says something to you or perhaps touches you without your consent. We're going to chat about it really, just a little way. Really interesting. Yep. Yeah, we're going to be discussing that very shortly. Also on the way, after nine, we're going to be chatting about the business of beauty with entrepreneur Pamela Laird. Big business. Mm -hmm. Later this hour, the Skin Nerd will be here to help with post-holiday skin problems. Put well, on we don't that need sunscreen. Put on that <laughs> sunscreen. Uh, from choosing the right food for your four-legged friend to the best treats to reward their tricks, we're going to get a lesson on healthy diets for our dogs. And our vet will be on hand to answer your dog-related questions. So do send them in to us on 0896 111. What dog biscuits do you use? <laughs> What treats? No, but you might have an issue with your dog Bonnie's as good as gold, isn't she? She's an absolute devil. Does she, does she yeah. do tricks? Uh, she sits. Well done, Bonnie. Food, She's too place. beautiful to have Roll to do anything over. else. That's and it. She tells me where to go. Our queen of baking, Catherine Layden, is in the kitchen. Catherine, what are you whipping up for us today? I'm making a basic egg sponge. I've just taken this one out of the oven, and we want it cold enough at um, half eight when I come up. Yeah. And I'm going to convert this basic egg sponge here into a chocolate mandarin layer cake. Oh, you're going to convert the house? How? Okay, right. You're going to get planning permission. Secret, secret, secret. Two tips coming up. Okay, lots of tips coming up. Okay, very good. Looks very, very tasty. Perfect, nice cup of tea. Now, Derek is at the Curra Race Course this morning, Kildare. How are we shaping up, Derek? Uh, well, Tommy, look, we're hard at it. We're mucking out here in the stables. Uh, Dick Barbasan is with us. Uh, Dick, tell us about the horse here. Oh, this is Grigal. She was second up the Curra one day. Uh, we hope she go closer to, than second someday. Um, and, and Tommy, are you looking forward to the uh, the Dubai Duty for Irish Derby? Oh yeah, it's going to be a hell of a race this year. Like the first, the third, the fourth from Epsom are all coming. Are all and, coming? Yeah. So we've a lot of we've a lot of runners, a lot of riders. Yeah, it's it's it's. I don't remember. I can't remember when there was such a competitive race. All right. It's going okay. To be a great well, event. Lots more to come here from the car right across the morning. Look, lads, I've a lovely bit of fertilizer here for you, Tommy. For the Look garden. At that. Yeah, for <laughs> mucking out. Back. Mucking out. <laughs> mucking out he is this morning. Fair play to you, Derek. Seeing the hand on the hip. What's that. going on there now? Let's talk about the horse oh, race. Better man to give it a good sweep. <laughs> Fair play to you. We compare 14 insurance quotes to get you the best deal. So choose chill and work smarter, not harder. Yes, thank you very much, Cheryl. Opening shots there of Gree Grail and her handler, uh, Robin Lynch. We're live here down in the Curra in County Kildare, right across tomorrow. We're going to be catching up with some of the crew here on the ground ahead of the Derby on Sunday, the 2nd of July. So that's all to come at 8.45 for all you horse loving people. Now, we're getting past 8 o'clock here together and opening look at weather and following that shaky start we had yesterday, plenty of thunderstorm activity across the island, much more drier 
and a lot more settled start out there this morning. Sunshine scraping through some areas, but again, showers to parts of the west and across Galway, Mayo, down across southern sections of Cork and Kerry as well. So stay nice and dry if you're in that neck of the woods. Now, right across this afternoon, that southerly airflow in the driving seat, light to locally moderate, once again from the southwest. That'll dry, that'll push up more showers as we work away across the day. Again, leaning on the heavy and thundery side for a time, some intense downpours with an ongoing risk of lightning and uh, possibly of hail would you believe out there today top temps of around 18 to 22 degrees and finally into tonight those showers mainly confined across northern and western coasts elsewhere it will clear out it's very similar to last night we're going to see some patchy mist a taster of coastal fog as well as we work away into your wednesday morning with overnight lows back to 8 to 13 degrees so that's how we're shaping up for now we'll be back again live at 8 35. Hello, time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Times. It's headline, Contractors Pause Work at Children's Hospital. The lead contractor on the National Children's Hospital has been told to stop key building work on half of the facility's operating theatres and make claims that a fresh setback could cost tens of millions. Warning of Irish fruit and veg shortage. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Growers and industry specialists have warned of shortages of Irish grown produce for the rest of the year due to months of heavy rain followed by drought. The Herald similarly goes with shoppers face thin end of the veg and reports that the shortage will include the likes of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli and carrots. The examiner leads with crack cocaine cases rise sevenfold. People are now being treated for crack cocaine in every county with treatment for cocaine powder. Uh, power use been having more than trebled in the last six years. Five are trapped inside Titanic submarine with air running out. That's a top story on the Daily Mail. A desperate search is underway for British billionaire Hamish Harding and his four companions after contact was lost with their submarine as it was visiting the shipwreck of the Titanic. Sun also covers that story with five lost on sub to Titanic. The mirror goes with fury over Dermot K. Word slur. And the star leads with fury over Fanning, Christy Rant. RT has received over 40 complaints over Dave Fanning's inappropriate remarks a day after Christy Dignam's death. Now, we were speaking earlier on about uh, what's going on with the LGFA and the fact that the women in both camogie and football are going to be playing under protest for the rest mm -hmm. of the season because they're looking for bare minimum standards like access to a doctor should they get injured. Access to pitches. Access to a pitch that they could train on. And that's what uh, we just heard Ashley was just saying that if the men's senior team are away training or at a match or whatever else then the women think that they might be able to use the pitch but then the under 20s might come in, the intermediates might come in So and they're so far down the pecking order and it's just trying to have that sort of rota that you know if you want to try and play at the top level and they are playing at the top level, they just have none of the supports. Uh, I play football in Westmeath and we are constantly treated as second-class citizens compared to men I've been playing on that team for the last 10 years and absolutely nothing has changed. And the GAA is built on both men and women. Like, it's as simple as that. Well, why don't we start dropping the ladies and ladies' football? We don't call it men's football or men's hurling. There's no difference. We all play football. Yep. And also the fact that it is still called ladies, you know, the LGFA and stuff, it's weird. Well, that's it, because I call it ladies, where you're saying, like, but that's it, should what it's women, called. it should be women's. Well, I'd call it women's, but technically the name is ladies, you know. Um, we were also talking as well about the summer holidays for secondary school students and teachers. Are they too long? And asking whether it should be the same as the primary schools, which is eight, eight weeks, weeks, but at the moment it's... And, and, and when you think about it, if you have a 12-year-old, 13, 14-year-old... Yeah, and you can't be watching them all the time. They're just going to be on their phones a lot yeah, of the time through the summer. Yeah, but could they be doing summer. babysitting or something? But they're not, they're not allowed to work, are they? But they're not. You can babysit. Surely there's someone um, who needs a bit we of help. We have a message in here saying, definitely too long. My daughter is first year and off for three months. I'm originally from Scotland. and Both primary and secondary schools are off for six weeks from the last week in June and return in mid-August. Uh, summer holidays in primary school are not long enough. Like the saying goes, you only get 18 summers with your child. Make the most of these. But I suppose we live in a country where... Most parents have to work. Well, and that's it. Like, I, we struggle with just childcare. What do you do with your kids? How do you look, get them looked after? Summer holidays in primary, not long. Uh, sorry, no, I've worked in media uh, prior to becoming a teacher, and teaching is by far the most stressful job I've ever had. I suppose we work in media. 
Yeah, teaching is definitely <laughs> more much. stressful than this. Uh, teachers are an absolute burnout by the time the holidays come around. Yeah, the, yes, the holidays are too long for secondary school, especially as teenagers can't work until they're 16 or now too old for summer camps. Uh, they should have six weeks like they have in the UK. And it's not being able to work. Like, we could all work when we were younger. You can't uh, yeah, work exactly. now. Yeah, exactly. I know. You know? Uh, interesting to see there at the minute, 39% of people only said that, yes, they are too long. So yeah. uh, do keep those messages coming in. Scan the QR code and let us know what you think. Uh, we'll be back with you on Ireland Day very shortly. Welcome back. Now, recently, me and my big mouth, I did a post on Instagram where I spoke about a stranger pinching my bum in public when I was at work. And the amount of messages I received from both men and women, by the way, it was like an avalanche. Everyone has a story from the hand up the skirt, walking through the pub, everyone at home has that story, to actually being physically attacked and dragged from public roads where something very dangerous could happen. So join us now to discuss this further. It's Professor Louise Crowley from UCC and journalist Aoife Moore. Good morning. Thanks, People, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we all saw your Instagram posts and the response it got was just, well, it was quite crazy to see some of the messages that you got. Like, if everybody has a story like yeah. this, but tell us what is, like, sexual harassment? Is there a definition? Yeah, I've actually found that in Ireland it's quite hard to define because we don't have like, a standalone definition of public harassment. So what I found was that harassment is an unwanted uh, pattern of behaviour that can leave you feeling intimidated, scared, annoyed and humiliated. That can be anything from rude gestures, phone calls, inappropriate touching, following, watching, anything that happens in yeah. public. So this is in public. Louise, yeah. this is something that you deal with. Yeah. You've got a bystander intervention programme. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly is that? So the bystander intervention programme comes from that the, the point of view of the bystander and it speaks to exactly what you said, that we're all witnesses to this behaviour. So obviously not only are people experiencing it, but the people around them are hearing it or seeing it as it plays out. Mm -hmm. And so what the programme is trying to do is to affect cultural change so that all of society recognises that we all have a role to play. So it does two things briefly. First of all, it educates the participants about what sexual harassment looks like. So just like Aoife said, it's that huge range of behaviours because yeah. obviously mm -hmm. we're all outraged when we hear someone is raped or sexually assault, severely sexually assaulted or indeed homicide. Um, but what we also need to be outraged about is exactly what happened to you, Marion. We need to be outraged when, when, we, when you see that happening or we hear a rape joke or we see something in our WhatsApp group that's a bit uncomfortable. And the essence is that we, we educate people to see this and we also... I suppose, tap into their realisation of their capacity to be the person who says, you know, that's not OK, yeah. and call someone out. Or if they're not comfortable doing that, when we're teaching them, you know, how to do it and when to do it and perhaps yeah. what to say, you know, maybe it's the easiest thing for you to do is to look at the vulnerable person and say, you know, if it's on the bus, would you like me to sit next to you? Mm -hmm. Or support that person if that's what you can do. But certainly we can all do something to affect change. We, we can insist on... I suppose, raising the threshold of acceptable behaviour so that when that happened to you, not only it's important that you recognise that it's sexual harassment because, you know, the normalisation of this type of behaviour means, you know, oh, that's, yeah, that's what happens. Like, students say to me, oh, Louise, I was in a nightclub and I was groped. But sure, of course I was groped. I was in a nightclub. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where the danger lies because we've stopped seeing it. And if we stop seeing it, well, then we're not going to make well, an intervention. See, I didn't. Like, I yeah. got... An, <clears throat> so there was a group of us there and we all kind of just froze. We assumed yeah. that we knew the person, that it was a joke. Yeah, and we started yeah. laughing along going, oh, it must be something. Like, I, you know, I thought it could have been you or Alan or anything like that and it would oh, have been grand. Tommy. No, no but you know what I mean. Your bum, but that's okay, it's not yeah. a stranger, is it? You Can we just say that's not OK? <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> but I got home to my partner <clears throat> and he was angry. Yeah. He was like, if you don't say anything, if you don't do anything, if you just go, this isn't a big deal, it doesn't matter. That means that it's just acceptable. I think, That's yeah. what got to him. I yeah. think as well, because you didn't react, the other people thought maybe they shouldn't react as well. I always think that's the thing that happens. Like if you're, you seem okay with it, the other people then don't want to cause a scene as mm -hmm. well. But is that's why we should be do you know, like I was at a festival at the weekend and there was a girl standing behind me in the bar and uh, in the queue for the bar and she just turned to me and I knew by the look on her face that the fellow behind her 
was annoying her in some okay. way. And I just said, do you want to go in front of me and I'll stand behind you? And it's just that kind of knowing as girl to girl. That look. That's exactly look. it. So, yeah. 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 Because you, what's interesting, because you have, if you're in those uncomfortable circumstances and situations, you kind of think fight or flight. But you were saying that you just froze and everybody froze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even I, the person behind you didn't do anything. She didn't say anything. anything to him. She just looked at me mm. and I pulled her out of the way. So are there other sides to this then that people should be aware of and understand? Because yeah. you don't know how you're going to react in an uncomfortable situation. So if you're if you're the vulnerable person, yeah. it is all of those things that you mentioned, the fight, the flight and the fight and the freeze, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes the freeze and the silence that comes with that could be perceived to be acceptance. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it is a difficult one to call whether somebody actually wants your help. So, you know, you can catch the eye. You can say, do you want to go to the loo? I mean, it can be very as simple as that. So when I say intervention, I don't mean, you know, kung fu fighting, jump in and yeah. sort it out. It can be removal, distraction, interruption, or just, you know, letting them know you see what's happening. And that in itself is an acknowledgement of, of the unacceptability of it. it. Yeah, I was just annoyed with myself when I'm like, what, you know, I'm middle-aged, what's happening to younger people? Because mm -hmm. the, the, the stories of, you know, women's boobs being touched yeah. mm -hmm. when they're sitting on a bus, yes. yeah. Yeah. walking through pubs, and we all have this. When we were in our 20s yeah. and we did nothing about it. Walk and that against was, the wall. But yeah. You have to walk yeah. against the wall, but you've got yeah. a skirt on. Yeah. And yeah. a hand goes up your skirt. Yeah. It goes inside your underwear. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, did that happen to you tonight? Yeah. Like, we've, this has been yeah. going on for decades, it's, Louise, and it's yeah. like we're accepting. I'm going, oh, yeah. that's just going to yeah. happen to you. Yeah. So a couple of things on that. So when you said nothing until your partner said, that's not OK, I mean, it's really important that we all know that's not OK. So not only when it happens to you, you realise that's a violation immediately. But the people around you also need to know that it's not OK and they need to speak up. And, you know, that is really important. And what I would say is, and, you know, it's not that... Uh, it, OK, I suppose the majority of victims are women. It's important we mm -hmm. recognise that. The stats are there. Mm -hmm. But the other flip side of that is that when I started the training, the only negative feedback I got back in 2016 was some of the male students saying, ah, this is very anti-men. So I realised how important the narrative was. So now we very expressly emphasise that most men are hugely, are very respectful. Yeah. But what I think is important to emphasise is that most men don't quite realise their capacity to step in, their capacity to say, oh, Tommy, you know, that's, that's a bit inappropriate. Yeah. Or Tommy, you know, maybe the morning after, you know what you did last night? Like, that's really not OK. She was very drunk or whatever the situation yeah. might be. Mm. And I think that peer calling out, lads saying to each other, you know, that's not OK. You're in a WhatsApp group. There's one particular yeah. guy sending very inappropriate images and nobody's saying anything. Yeah. And that's yeah. really difficult. So what do you do? My advice? Tommy, you speak to Fred and Fred, you say, gosh, I think that's a bit odd. And Fred says, I thought that too, but I said, if, if I said something that I might get kicked out, but you, you get your allies mm. and you realise it's not okay. And then that voice becomes loud and it shrinks the voice of the perpetrators. And suddenly they're othered because what my programme tries to do, I teach, you know, full groups. I, I teach, you know, we're with UCC Rugby, and other UCC men in Soccer, the, okay, yeah. yes, okay. UCC GA, I'm running a pilot with Cork GA locally with clubs. Um, and what happens is that when you get those people in a room and you demonstrate the impact of what they think might be a bit of crack, but they realise what it's like to walk in the shoes of the person, you would be amazed to watch them grow into allies. It's actually yeah, fabulous. Yeah. And one other key thing is that I'm in 50 secondary schools across the country. I have a pilot TY programme. And one really intriguing thing was a group of boys told their teacher that they thought sexual harassment had to be physical okay. to matter. Yeah. They never realised the danger and the damage of their words. And, you know, and so that is so critical. So for me, as, as an educator, the information is what we need to build on, but it's societal learning yeah. experience. One or two of us won't crack it. Yeah. We need everybody to realise that they have a role to play. And if you allow it, you know, if you if you permit something, in essence, you're promoting it. If you see something troublesome and you walk on by, I hate to say it, but I firmly believe you're part of the problem. So let's mm. not be part of the problem, but let's be the solution. And I particularly yeah. call mm -hmm. on men to realise that we don't think hashtag you know, not all men, all that stuff. Of course. What I do think is hashtag yes, all men. Speak up, say it's Our not all okay. men are in a WhatsApp group or in a, um, in yeah. a, a situation and, uh, with friends and you can yeah. easily say to them, listen, but, yeah. don't do that. And then you know what you're doing? Mm. Sorry, Aoife, you're, you're, you're kind of drawing a line and then things won't escalate mm -hmm. because otherwise there's a sense of permission that mm. that's OK, I'll do it again. And yeah. if you're so inclined, it'll escalate. Yeah. yeah, and I think we fail, especially like some of my mates said, you know, when they were calling stuff out about like, horrible means or whatever it was 
uh, the mates were calling him the fun police. They were like, yes. oh, you're no crack at all. And yeah. I was like, I'd rather be no crack than be sexist and yeah. offensive. But also, we don't get the joke. You know, if a woman, if a yeah. fella touches a woman's boob, it's like, oh, God, oh, she's mine as crack, calm yeah. down. Yeah. I would yes. say as well, even from like a male point of view, we all worked in my dad's pub growing up. And there was an older crowd um, that drank in there on a Saturday night. And my wee brother was like 20, 21, and he's a very handsome young man and was a rugby player at the time. And the amount of women in their 40s and 50s who used to punch his arse yeah. and you grab him as he's yeah. walking past. And I think that really showed him, even though it was a really horrible experience, that it's absolutely not all right. Like, he's, I remember him saying, it makes me really uncomfortable and they think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. when it, it's so funny, the messages I got from fellas going, oh God, when, and it seemed to be older women to yeah. younger men doing it, and they were like, I feel re it, like it really oh, yeah. makes me like so it does, it does yeah. happen to yeah. guys. Because of course absolutely. it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah one of, like, one of um, what happened one night to my wee brother when my ma was in the pub, yeah. and my brother had to say to my mom, I don't go over and say anything, because my ma was raging. She was going crazy. Yeah, because she couldn't believe people would do this. Mm. It's, it's, it's just so, it's really interesting what you're doing, just this conversation of being yeah. like, let's just make it a nicer place and not yes. be like, you're no crack if you don't let someone touch but, your body and yeah. you don't want them to. But the good news is there's a huge appetite for it. So not only am I in third level across the country and some second level schools, but organisations. So uh, sporting clubs are coming to me. I'm working with the law society, the uh, Irish medical organisation, the arts sector. They brilliant. all want um, to be part of it. What you're change. saying even as well, that yeah. that it's it's not all physical as well, it's verbal, the whole side of it yeah. as well. Listen, we'd love to to hear from this as well, 0896 as well. Ethan Moore, great to have you with Thank us you. as Thanks always. So and of course, Louise Crowley, law lecturer at UCC. And it is called the Bystander Intervention Programme. Yeah. Well done to you I for that. Uh, good thing Hope for the leg is OK. <laughs>
Now we're going to add optional, but yeah, a bit of orange. Drop orange. Some orange essence. Lovely. Lovely. Now, brilliant. And then we're going to fold in the remainder of the flour, and then I'm going to transfer it to a Swiss roll tin that I've lined with greaseproof paper. So why a metal spoon and not say a spatula or whatever? Because I'm, well, if you use a spatula as well, oh, right. something that has an edge on it, okay. because you've got to cut through it, okay. so you don't allow that air that we've beaten in there for a long time. We're in. Okay, you need to, to escape the air in there. OK, so just gently cut through the mixture and the larger the spoon you use, of course, and the larger the bowl you use, the quicker you get the mixture Lovely. folded through. There now we, we just transfer that to the prepared tin and you line the tin with your greaseproof paper and you bring the paper up about half an inch above the edge of the tin. That's to prevent the edges from scorching. OK. Now we just pour that through. I'm fine. And... Do you, ba you don't do baking, now. So. I, I can bake. You use bake. Did Oops. you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was your specialty? Buns. <laughs> buns, good. Very good, well done. Just normal old buns. <laughs> not muffins, not yeah. anything fancy. Just, Just buns. buns. Just a bit some of buns. icing on top. Now, bit of icing on the top. Spread Brilliant. that in the Love tin that. and put it into a preheated oven, 200 centigrade, 400 Fahrenheit, gas mark six, for okay. about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on your oven. Another small tip, just tap it twice or three times on the border of the table before you put it in. Okay. That's to burst any air bubbles. So that'll take about 12, 12 minutes about, OK? OK. Now we just layer the cake. So that, is that chocolate butter icing? Chocolate butter icing, okay. yep. Can I, can I cut a slice, Catherine? Do, of course. Awesome. Get it up yeah. there for yourself. Oh, look at this one. Well, so it's actually, here. it's melted a bit in here because it's, it's so warm. It's melting with heat. I'm melting myself, Tommy. Oh, I know, it is roasted. This stage. Now. Right, I'm going to grab a little knife here. There you go, look. Look at that. Look at that for you. Now, uh -huh. and if possible, it's even sliding while we're working here, right. if possible, put a, a non-cut side at each side of the cake, as you see. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, OK. So you've got the bottom Because that's it. I actually thought it was chocolate sponge you'd made, but obviously no. you've covered it all. Let's have a look It's here. a bit much with the... Um, with just the chocolate, with all the chocolate. Now... Oh. We're going to do all four sides. Oh, yeah, go on. With the butter icing. Have you got two plates there, Tommy? Oh, I haven't two, so don't you worry about us, And have you got your forks to taste? Oh, we're flying, don't you? You keep going, you're playing, there, Catherine. A, you're playing an absolute blinder, Catherine. Well Turn done. We're there, not there, doing anything. See it. Oh, I know. Hey, Inside. look at that. You're going to sneak some of this Yum. from this here. So you just kind of build it up and cover it in chocolate? It's covered in chocolate, basically, and then dip it in some chocolate vermicelli. Sorry, Make it time chocolate to get this what? Done. Chocolate strands or chocolate vermicelli, as it's called. I What's that, that now? Like now? Oh, it's this. The sides. Oh, the piping kind of thing? Yeah. Is it? Not the piping, no, the stuff on the sides. If I show you now. We're nearly there. So here we have our... Are they the little, like, hundreds chocolate. of thousands things? Yes, except they're ah. in chocolate. Ah, yes, my kids love them. Now, turn that out. Spread the chocolate so they're on top. Cho chocolate vermicelli. Vermicelli, yeah. Ooh. Now we're going there to just go, rip now. the cake and tip it onto the chocolate. So no matter how bad it is, you just cover it all in, like if I was to make <laughs> this and it was rubbish. It didn't work out too well, you could do this, Tommy. And yeah? I cover it in vermicelli and no one tell the difference. No. Genius. And then you put lovely mandarin on the top. And then you just finish it off, put that aside for a minute, with some mandarin orange segments, chocolate butter icing first, and then, or you can put the chocolate straight down on it if you wish. Oh, yeah, see? Um, put the oranges down straight on it. I'm just going to pipe around the edge. Ah, uh, you're very fancy. Look at that. Now, you don't have to do this, but it does improve the appearance, doesn't it? Well, it does. Well, we've got the done one here that looks lovely. And there we look, go. And here's the finished version. Now, look at the finished <coughs> version. Right there. Now. Just put that on that. Delicious, delicious, you delicious. You like it? Catherine Lane, it's absolutely good. I love the sponge. It's so soft. Mm. Isn't it lovely so and nice? So light. Yep. Um, Catherine Lane, Catherine. My fantastic. pleasure. Enjoy. As always, delicious. Cheers. Now, after the break, the Skin Nerd is going to be here to share some post-holiday skincare. Look at that. Just what we need. Coming up uh, after uh, this short break. Mmm.
Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Whether you've been sunning yourself at home or abroad, overexposure to the sun can take its toll on our skin. Here with some post, uh, some advice on post-holiday skin is the skin nerd, aka Jennifer Rock. Hello, Jennifer. It's lovely to have you here. Hi, um, holidays, sun exposure, obviously it does affect our skin, right? Absolutely. Do you know what? You have to enjoy your holiday. You have to look forward to it. I think we all tend to know that you exfoliate yourself before you go on holiday. You need your SPF all year round. But definitely whilst on holiday, but what you do when you come home when your skin is feeling tired, lethargic, pigmentation might become a reality. Your skin on your body in particular, because we don't expose it all year round, can become extremely dry. So there are a few solutions here to talk through. Do okay. we feel like our best selves when we come home? Because you come home from holiday and you feel like you need another holiday. So how yes. do we feel good when we are home? Uh, what about the pigmentation? What does that mean and what does it look like post-holiday? Yeah. So pigmentation essentially is a manifestation where you visibly see a darkening on the skin and it tends to come on the highest parts of the face thinking about it because the sun induces those spots. Yeah. So essentially it's darkness here, across here, up but it can happen all over. You'll often notice across the decollete. Essentially it's when you look in the mirror and you think I've got a few freckles from the sun. That typically is pigmentation. So it starts off quite nice and delicate and little kind of soft, aesthetically pleasing freckles and then over the years because damage of pigmentation can take up to 20 years to truly come through. So me now heading towards 40, it's damage that I had when I was in my late teens to 20s so it doesn't oh. come up immediately so don't you know it really is about trying to ensure that you protect against further pigmentation and repair the past but it can make you feel a little bit disheartened in yourself because it can look people describe it like dirty or coffee stained because it looks what we describe as mottled yeah so it can, it's just essentially why people tend to lean on foundations they want to even it out so pigmentation is a true frustration post holiday is there something we can do to treat it so the, the first and most important thing genuinely is SPF yeah. so if you're looking in the mirror and you feel that your skin looks slightly discoloured, a little bit sun-kissed as people like to call it, or freckled all over. And they're not freckles that you're genetically born with. These are sun damage that have happened over years. SPF is a non-negotiable to ensure that you protect against further damage because when that cell is damaged, it's more likely to come darker and darker over years to come. Gotcha. And then antioxidants. So with this first product that I have here, so this is Neostrata, one of my absolute go-tos always. This is their Enlightened Skin Brightener, SPF 35. Now, you've heard me talk about antioxidants a lot. Antioxidants are essentially, they fight against oxidization. The sun is probably the largest piece that is going to cause oxidization within our skin. So not only does this have the ability like resource and all and different ingredients like neoglucosamine that will help to reduce pigment, but it also will help to build the skin's resistance up to extra light. So okay. a really beautiful product, very lightweight on the skin, evens out brightness and darkness, beautiful texture, 365, but definitely post-holiday. I can wear it, I don't know about you, but I get it on my upper lip. It's just not the place you want to have yeah, it. Yeah, I wear so... hats. I wear Factor exactly. 50. I've That's, got everything on. It's a good point. So clothes definitely and staying out of direct yeah. sun is definitely key but the reality is that damage can be there from childhood okay. so definitely one to consider and what's this now, one we got here what's this one going to do Ivana Breen a phenomenal facialist a lady I've held in such high esteem for many a year a phenomenal Dublin based facialist if you haven't gone to see her go to see her but she has teamed up with Skin Made so she's been distributing and recommending this brand for years but now they've come together and they actually have their own product together such a beautiful story to watch unfold yeah. so this is a body product it's a body SVF so it's to protect and care sun oil body now try this on Beautiful texture, very hydrating, olive oil, grape feet, but it has a really extreme, like a really powerful antioxidant in there called acetamsin. And that is, again, back to antioxidants, fight against free radicals. So when you apply this oh. and put that like, a little bit on the leg, it just it gives a nice sheen. It's really hydrating, locks in moisture, but it's an SPF 50 as well. So it's cold pressed, it's organically farmed, extremely affordable, little goes a very long way. Take my fake tan oil. off, am I? No, honestly, apply it like that. And that's a key thing. Like you can apply tan whilst in the sun and bounce back home from yeah. the sun, but do make sure you apply your SPF on over it. So they first of all had a face product, now they have their body product, really powerful product, beautiful ingredients and very good. Gonna help you with dry skin, obviously. It is incredible. Yeah. You know that you know when you cross your legs and you feel like you can yes. see yes, divine for it, but SPF in it also. Why are we taking gummies so, this morning? Oh Novo Mins, yes. So I don't know about you, but when I come home from holidays, my nails on my like on my hands in oh, particular. Don't I know even. nails are not a conversation with you at the moment, no. I know. But this is something for you to consider now taste that and tell me how you find it. Honest answer. I would pop those <laughs> like they're sweet. <laughs> but you know what the frustration is at times for a lot of, a lot, like I'm always recommending supplementation. People don't like the feeling of it, the taste of it, they can't swallow it. The whole concept behind this brand is that they're, God, they're yum. they really are delicious. So they're very easy and desirable to take because consistency and compliance with supplementation is absolutely paramount. No artificial colors in it, gluten-free, cruelty-free. It's biotin. So biotin, otherwise known as B7, a very powerful ingredient okay. that you can ingest that really help to strengthen your hair, your nails, your 
your skin. So post-holiday, when you're feeling like they were gorgeous two yeah. weeks ago, how do I keep that strength? This is something you can take 365. And they're the first brand within the EU and UK to have the high, as high a level of biotin as it does inside. Fantastic. I'm going to make you do something that you do very well. 30 seconds to go. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing with this? OK, so I love, as we know, a facialist at home. So this essentially is your van Vanity Planet. It's their era. It's a steamer. It detoxifies the skin. But doing it carefully is important. So you apply it. You literally sit over the table, have the steamer right in front of you. It unclogs your pores. Now, post-holiday, when you plan... It yes, you can indeed press a little button there. You can... You'll see the steam come out in a second. There's that. Perfect. Oh, come on in a sec. You can... The little pods at the front, you can change in and put essential oils in it. It detoxifies the skin, clarifies the skin, hydrates the skin. But when I post-holiday, I definitely feel I'm congested. I've blackheads. Yes. I've had makeup on, SPF clogging. Perhaps I've had a tipple or two. My skin is just tired, lethargic. Definitely 365, but post-holiday, just to give you that rep. Last one is, I get a lot of false extensions while on holidays for my lashes, but this one is definitely ideal because when you come home and your lash is a little bit perhaps tired or fatigued, this is your starter kit. It's wisps, they're really friendly. Oh, there's my steam coming through now. Um, but this is a very beginner <laughs> friendly concept. So essentially what you see inside is that you have your, um, they're like little wisps of mascot <laughs> lashes and you put them on underneath the lash and That's it just there. looks really delightful. It doesn't irritate them, but a very clever way to have lashes that don't damage but look fluttery and eyelashy. She's going to have more information on her Instagram after this because she does yep. great shots. As always, Jennifer Rock, this thank, you. thank you so much for joining us. This is lovely. We'll be back with you very shortly on Ireland AM. This is nice. Hello, welcome back to Ireland AM. Coming up, we've got catwalk colour combos, doggy diets and a beauty boss. She survived Alan Sugar's boardroom and lived to tell the tale. Beauty entrepreneur Pamela Laird is dropping by at about quarter past nine this morning. Plus, Mandy Meyer is here with looks for the catwalk. What have you got for us today, Mandy? Good morning. So it's all about colour combinations that look expensive wearing. Because okay. sometimes people don't know what to put together and we obviously have the colour combo here of the blues and the oranges that we see on Dervla. But I've gone for a lot of creams this morning as well, which we'll see later on in the fashion slot. That's lovely. That's cut really yeah, that's it works fabulous. Well, under, it? Yeah, it yeah. the shoes as well. So we're going to have that in just a little while now. I was just outside. There's a puppy. There's a puppy outside. Tommy, <laughs> how are you doing? There sure is. Look at the puppy. My little puppy this has been, of course. I am joined by Liffy and Beth Martin Breen. Good morning to you, Martin. Good how morning, you? Tommy. Uh, yeah, look, really excited to be here. Great uh, stuff. Well, listen, we're here to talk about, of course, overfeeding your pet. I have a cocker spaniel at home, and sometimes, particularly this barbecue season, I drop the odd sausage. Well, the kids do. Is that a, a, a you're, no? you're not the I only one, no. and that's a no-no from the vet who's going to give out to all the, the listeners out and the, and the people watching that are giving their pets treats. And we'll just talk about the ones that maybe are a little bit of a healthier option. Okay. And maybe the things to watch out for, especially for barbecue season, um, where the skewers can end up being really dangerous if left around. Um, you oh, would, you'd yes, be surprised okay. dogs like eating those as well. Yes, okay. <laughs> so to watch out. Okay, okay great stuff. I know I'm going to be told off in this segment. And puppy chinos. Yeah, Oh, puppy oh, chinos. chinos. <laughs> well, listen, I do baby chinos with my daughter. I love a cappuccino, so puppy chinos. Puppy chinos, yeah, like there'll be lots of different trends online of, of what to give your pets, especially in the hot weather. So we'll be talking about whether they're safe or not and maybe if it's suitable for your dog. Perfect. OK, looking forward to that, Martin. Chat to you later on now from horses. No, dogs to horses. Derek's at the Curra race course, Derek. How are we getting on? Yes, Tommy, come here. Puppuccino sounds good. Send one down our way. Anyway, the rain just about holding off down here in the car. Of course, we're talking all things uh, Derby Day in and around 9.10 here this morning. And guys, we're going to be giving this bad boy a go. <laughs> I'll give it my best shot, OK? <laughs> see how we get on. He's going to give it socks. He's going to be riding a fake horse. This is what you're going to want to see on Ireland AM in just a little while. Derek, we will talk to you very shortly. It is now. We compare 14 insurance quotes to get you the best deal. So choose chill and work smarter, not harder. Thank you very much, team. We're live down here at the Curra in County Kildare. We're talking all things horses. We're talking all things Derby Day in the next few moments. So do hang with us for that. Now, slipping past nine o'clock here together. Let's take a look. Weather-wise, that's how it's shaping up. And it is a bit of a shaky start to parts of the west and across southern sections of Munster. Plenty of showers now trailing around through parts of Galway into Mayo, down around southern sections of Cork and into Kerry. So stay nice and dry if you are living in that neck of the woods. The rain just about holding off elsewhere. But 
good deal of cloud cover and limited bright breaks. Now, right across today, in fact, that southerly airflow in the driving seat pushing up that rain. So bit by bit, any dryness is going to slip and we're going to see plenty of thundery activity out there today. Once again, some intense falls of rain. So very similar to yesterday, we're looking at that ongoing risk of spot flooding surface water out and about on the roads too. So do be mindful if you're driving top temps of around 18 to 22 degrees and those light to locally moderate southwesterly winds. Finally, then tonight, the good news is that that rain dying back, mainly confined across western and northern coasts. Elsewhere, we'll clear out some patchy mist, a taste for fog as well, feeding its way into your Wednesday morning with overnight lows back to around 8 to 13 degrees. So that's how we're shaping up for now. We're talking all things horses in a few minutes' time. Chill Insurance work harder so you can work smarter. We compare 14 quotes to get you the best deal. Welcome back. Now, earlier on, we asked you if the school holidays are too long and the results are in with 62% of people saying, no, they're not too long, 38% say that they do. 62% of people being teachers and <laughs> students, I'd say. <laughs> uh, school holidays, way too long. I have a transition year student off since the middle of May and a second year student off the, since the third week of May, May. Both myself and my husband work full time and I know both kids are just mm. sitting at home on their phones all day. Um, I once asked my brother-in-law why he became a secondary school teacher. He said three reasons. June, July and August. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. We were right giggles so that good. one earlier. <laughs> uh, I'm a single mother and while I work, uh, my son is in school. It's a nightmare to try and sort childcare during the school holidays. I only get two weeks holidays during the summer. So the rest of the weeks is pure stress when there's very little support available and it's very expensive to pay daycare. And as well, like if the Gale talks and you have camps, like I remember just being horsed out to these camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like go off there and do that and it was painful, but you did it. But now it is like, it's expensive. So expensive. So if you're a single mom, you yeah. don't have that money to be like, so Big I'm time. finding cool camps. Oh, even it's a single crazy. mom, any Anyone. people who are oh, struggling yeah. at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We were also talking about uh, the LGFA, the fact that they are going to play under protest because they're looking for the bare minimum of standards, you know, to be able to play on a pitch is kind of what they're asking for. Uh, the GAA players, my youngest daughter has played twice in Crow Park with her club and county. She has never played in her own county grounds, which is Netwatch, Cullen Park and Carlow. As yeah. the girls, they've never gotten to play there. Sad, isn't it? Uh, I manage a camogie team in Kildare and had to move a championship match like lose home advantage so that the senior hurlers could have a pitch for a training session. What? They they always ah. get they always get first preference and camogie are doing better in the club than the hurling but that's the lads getting for a training session. For a training session, mad, that's isn't bad. It? We were talking um, as well about kind of public harassment and these program that's involved. Uh, Louise Reynolds, so interesting. Uh, you see, see a yeah. bystander program intervention program whereby if you see something, you kind of call it out because people can freeze in those situations. A message here that says, I was out one night around 15 years ago in a nightclub. I was on the dance floor. A lad came up to me and literally grabbed grabbed my breast very roughly. And then he said he was checking to see if they were real. I hadn't been speaking to this fella at one stage during the night to say I was shocked is an understatement. I was in my early 20s at the time and I still remember it like it was yesterday. And you just stand there and you don't know what to do. I freeze. Kind of freeze. Uh, and that's what Louise is saying as well. And Derek's just said, if you see it, if you witness it, make sure you report it as well. Um, listen, thank you so much. We have a huge amount of messages there on all yeah. these different topics tomorrow. It's been really, really interesting chat. Yeah. But and now, we'd love to keep on going, but we think you want to see the next thing. Yeah, well, we all we want to see, to see this. Uh, Derek is at the Curra Race Course this morning, and uh, but he's going to give us a lesson in something, Derek. Take it away. <laughs> Yes, guys, I am, of course, waiting to see what we have in a few moments time. Anyway, welcome down here to the Curra in County Kildare. We're talking all things horses uh, this morning in the run up to the Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby kicking off here on July the 2nd. Evan Arkwright is with us, also Claude of Fleming. And we're going to start off with you, Evan, because it's a big day in the Irish racing calendar. Huge day, big preparation going on, Derek, as you've seen all morning. Uh, 30th of June to 2nd of July, everything builds to the weekend to the Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby. Probably the most prestigious race we run here in Ireland. Ireland, big world exposure and a really brilliant weekend. There's lots for everyone, Derek. Style, music, fun, uh, great entertainment for families, but at all the core is, is the racing. The and racing. Now, this is a grade one race, so there's, there's high stakes. 
big high stakes runners you know best jockeys best trainers coming over something that Ireland should be really proud of we hope lots and lots of people will come out with what's going to be a fantastic weekend the race is celebrating 158 years great history amazing winners uh, and this year looks like it's going to be a tremendous race so we hope plenty of people come and then all go into Kildare Town as well Kildare Town have a big festival also going on uh, during that weekend Nathan Carter playing a live gig there in the square on the Saturday night so the whole community get behind it and by the way the course is looking absolutely smashing out there yeah it is the lads have done a really remarkable job Richie and his team uh, it's a fantastic track it's hallowed ground as I think we said earlier um, and that's uh, the best horse will win on the day and, and that's the most important thing it's flat thing. and it's fast which is what we love now Clona you're looking after all the mouths here you have a lot of them to feed on, on race day we sure do we are at full capacity now for the weekend with um, over 1500 um, guests in hospitality um, with that we'll have about 420 wait staff as well as 25 chefs led by um, Mark Usher, um, guaranteeing that they'll have the best culinary experience possible. What are we talking food wise then? Well, preparations <laughs> are already in full flow. Um, we will likely have um, about one and a half tons of vegetable and potatoes being prepared over the next week, about nearly 2,000 burgers, um, just to give you a couple of, of items that will be, in, uh, be prepared over the next few days. Um, on top of that, we'll anticipate about 36,000 pints of Guinness, 4,000 bottles of beer, 8,000 soft drinks, 4,000 teas and coffee. Bunch, right? Yeah, so a busy, and, busy... And a big focus on sustainability too. Absolutely. Uh, um, not only that, but we also focus on supporting local. So by using local produce, we also manage to reduce our carbon footprint. Where can we find out more online, by the way? Cora.ie. Lots of special ticket offers available on Cora.ie for the three days, the 30th of June to the 2nd of July. Right through until the 2nd of July. Anyway, we're going to pop over here. Lauren has got my silks here. We're in the pink and green here this morning, and we're going to button up here. Hopefully you like what you're going to see now. We've got the helmet here as well. So I'm going to get up on this little horse simulator. This is the first time for me bear in mind I'm from a farm down in Limerick now Tommy and Word can you see me there guys can you see me are you with me there back in studio can we you want up? to get the music going are you ready do you want a commentary guys do you want a commentary yes go we on. do you do you do your commentary Come on. Yeah, all right, right. OK, here we Off go. It goes. And it's all I am on the outside in the closing stages of the 2023 Dubai Duty Free Irish Derby. It's neck for neck, it's it for that with three furlongs to go. Left on the mark. Come on. And the red Come on. Try to make a two win for the back or Will you fall to the final two follows with not a whisker between them? They're pushing hard. They're chasing fast. They're in the final follow. They're on the horizon. I'm going in there. It's an epic encounter. It's a win for Bo. It's a win for Carl. Horse racing history in the making. There we go. Love it. Race. Love it. Well done, Team yes. Ireland. M. Love it, Derek. Yes. Well done, M. He was, he was the jockey, the trainer, the horse, and the commentator. I mean, he did absolutely oh, no, everything. He's he just there we go. Uh, it's Derek, absolutely class. Well done. I'm telling you, commentary is the way forward for him. I'm not he? even joking. Virgin Media, can you sign him up so that we can hear what he's going to do? That's I don't care if he gets like any it. of the names right. Oh, I love Derek. He's just so funny. Thank well you, done. And uh, all co the, the Dubai Duty Free course on June, July 2nd as well. Make sure you go. Now, after the break, entrepreneur Pamela Laird is going to be here. And we're not going to be talking about We're going to be talking no. about running a business and returning to college. See you in a few. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, our next guest is an entrepreneur and beauty guru who made her name for herself on The Apprentice and The Dragon's Den. Here to chat business and boardrooms, it's Pamela Laird. Good morning. How oh, are you? Morning. You're never getting away from The, the Dragon's yeah. Den and the yeah, business and the boardrooms and all that it's kind here of stuff. To stay. I don't mind. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's better than 10 siblings. I mean, I'm not going to that either. So I'll take it. Exactly, I'll take yeah. it. Sorry, for sure. The amount of people that come in and say it to him as soon as they sit down, it's unbelievable. But for you, Makeup was something that you got into from a really, it's become your life, but a really early age, right? Yes. Just like copying celebs or whatever we do now. Like Totally. I think my mum having a beauty salon when I was growing up, just it was there and I loved everything about it. And yeah, I think we were unlucky with the trends at the time. Luckily, there are no photos. I think we were very lucky to have social media, but the blue mascara, you know, the glitter eyeshadow, the foundation lips. Yeah. The foundation lips and what's, then the What's lip a foundation lip? You just... You, 
put foundation on you'd have no lip Violet colour. Jo- so you've no co- oh, right. no colour. No I don't know why. I have no idea why. It was a trend. But are these trends not all coming back again, kind of due to TikTok? They are coming back. I think they're a bit luckier than we were at that age. The makeup's better, the technique step by steps are there on TikTok. And I think we tried to recreate celeb looks and I don't know if it worked very well. Or just putting that line there. Just yes. do nothing. Oh, my neck doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm just going to be completely different. My neck doesn't. You can't see anything underneath this. It's fine. I can put on whatever makeup I want. Sure, you're young. You have to Gosh. experiment with these things, don't you? That's what happens. There you go. That's you to experiment. Did you? Blue <laughs> eyeliner. Going well, crazy I did for it all. Try to cut my hair. Um, it is weird in your industry, though, what can happen because of TikTok. Like, I was talking to someone the other day and she was like, oh, we can't keep. And I think it's an Elizabeth Arden eight hour cream yeah. in the pharmacy in Mullingar because someone liked it on TikTok. I know. And it's teenagers buying this. Is that not Prince Harry? Was in- <laughs> that, that was him as well. That was another, another oh. influencer. Okay. Yeah, another influencer. But it's amazing. Yeah, right? I know it is. And I think it's great. You know, it's really accessible. People are looking for authentic voices on TikTok. I mean, anybody can pick up their phone, share their story of why they love a product, and that can take something viral overnight. But that's pressure, right? Because then you're kind of like, I need to get my product into someone's hand who's going to say something. And like, it is. It's because it can it can all be a bit of nothing. Definitely. I think we're, we're so used to the curatedness of Instagram over the last few years that that was very pretty, very finished, very polished and then you look at TikTok and something can just be raw, very unfinished, unplanned, unscripted and that can just take a product viral. So it is really hard to keep track and know what's coming because you don't know what product someone's going to stumble on and decide to share. I mean and social media it's so important for our business and yes. stuff at the minute in your own business. Like there's a lot of talk at the minute with leaving cert and school or whatever else and you spoke quite openly how school didn't really suit you that, yes. and you didn't initially when you left school didn't go straight on to like next level education, you decided to go in to set up your own business. That's right. Do you think that, you know, schools teach people the right tools that they need for life after? You know, is it too heavily focused on learning things then? I think it is, honestly. I felt like I had no place in academia. I just felt like I didn't fit in. I really wanted to work and things that I was learning, even business, and I was trying to see how I could apply that and I couldn't really figure out how the theory applied to the actual reality. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no, not for me, no college. And I went on and just ran my own business. So I do think there's a bit of a gap for people who don't feel naturally Mm -hmm. academic, but have a natural graft for business. And so obviously now I'm back around and I'm in university now. See, this is the thing. You set up your own business, right? Really young, Moxie loves. You've done like The Apprentice, all that kind of thing. And then you went back, you were doing your master's, your MBA, aren't you? Yes, I am. How are you finding that? Because that's intense. It's so much more intense than I ever thought. But I I never thought I would say I would love learning. But honestly, I'm loving it. Because it's so practical from what I've done. And I think that's what people maybe miss. They say, oh, I better go into college now, straight out of school with no experience. And then they end up hating the subject they picked. Happens to so many people. For me, I was able to get real world experience and then go back and do it. Which I think, I'm lucky that that worked out for me. Do you think that the business in school is maybe not practical enough? It's more just theory and too much about the books and actual real world experience? I think so. But look, I think it's going to be hard to reform a a long standing Mm. education system. But for a lot of people who feel like they really want to get their hands dirty in something, Mm. that just isn't there when you're in school. Like you're learning just to pass an exam and it feels really useless at the time. Uh, but, but you did grow up in a house where it was, you know, your mom's an entrepreneur, your dad's an entrepreneur. They're like, give it a go. Yeah. Which is kind of amazing when it's like, oh, sure, yeah, they're going to support me. Definitely. And I think for a lot of people who don't have that influence at home, like having your both your parents be entrepreneurs, they don't get to see, believe and think that they can do it too. Whereas my parents did it. I saw that as an example and they said to me, do whatever you want, you can, whatever you put your mind to. So I know for a lot of people in school now doing their leaving cert it can be difficult because they're like what am I going to do you know they don't have that example next to them and listen there's so many people who are doing exams at the minute you know those exams and school doesn't fit everybody and once you get those exams out of the way you know the world is your oyster to go out and find yourself as well listen we saw a picture of you and your lovely dad there as well last time you were on talk and you were on talk about his dementia diagnosis I mean how how is he getting on he's okay I was saying to you guys just before that it was Father's Day at the weekend and you know to see that glimmer of my dad again giving him his Father's Day card was really lovely because sometimes you think oh is he going to know is he going to you know be able to tell what day it is and so yeah it was a really really nice moment he's like am I a number one dad you know the card said number one so yeah it's tough it's tough but that was a nice a nice moment because he's coming up on nine years diagnosed yes. with Alzheimer's he lives at home with you and your mom yeah what, 
I'd like the day to day can't be easy. Like watching your dad kind of go away. Yeah, it's it's so tough. And I think for the person, I've said this before, with Alzheimer's or dementia, they can be blissfully unaware at times. You know, there are there are moments of confusion, but often they're quite content. And it's really the families around yeah. the person watching them kind of disappear. It's extremely tough. And for my mom, who is his carer, that is so tough for me to see her um, lose the person she loves, you know, because they're there, but they're not there, really. And the support that carers get as well, like, it, I mean, it's their full-time job, yeah. you know, and even you said letting him get away, but she can't really be the person she wants to be as well all the time because she has to be home. Totally. Or has to get you in to help or someone else to help. It's very difficult. It's so difficult, and I don't think people realise that family carers didn't know that this was going to happen. Yeah. This is something that they've fallen into. And while we're lucky to have them at home, it's very difficult for carers. It's mm -hmm. hard for their own. They don't have their own life in the same way. Now, my mum did find a lot of help with the Alzheimer's Society. She did do a carers course with them. So there are supports Brilliant. there, but it's still, I think toughest on the family rather than the person suffering. That's and there's tens of thousands of families who are living with this. Yes watching their loved one go away as the as the loved one doesn't know. There is a memory walk. I know that you do this every single yes. year. For that. Is, is it September 24th? That's right. September 24th. And this will be my third year being an ambassador yeah. for the Alzheimer's Society. And I'm just so thrilled to put a spotlight on a charity that often doesn't get as much attention. Because I think there's a bit of taboo and people don't like to talk about dementia. It's upsetting, I understand. But I think it's really important. Um, and the memory walk's fantastic. You can register on memorywalk.ie. Go out with your family. There's 30 locations across Ireland. So pick Take the one closest to you, grab a family member, grab the dog and get out and raise some much needed funds for a great charity. Yeah. Fantastic. And as There's you said, someone. tens of thousands of people who are in this situation yeah. across Ireland as well. Listen, yeah, the Memory Walk, 24th of September. Make sure you look it up. And of course, your, the business Moxie Loves is flying as always too. I know, the last time you were here, busy, you were busy, heading busy, off busy. to college. You heading off to college again today? I'm doing a few assignments. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I am working. She's busy. She's working to from do. home today. Nice. Amanda, Larry, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us. You're so good. <laughs>
So don't be afraid of, of the basic colours as well. Very think. good, it's okay. Now, Derbla. No, we've gone completely the opposite with Derbla. Okay, yeah. No, it's just like we're doing muted colours so and she we brings are, out an orange yeah, well, and a blue. No, we have more muted colours coming, but I'm loving this because it's this very simple wrap dress, as you can see, again, from the House of Logo as well. It is a full wrap, so it doesn't open up. Do you know what Sometimes with a yeah. wrap it does, or obviously come back and shows a little bit more of the leg. This is actually a full wrap with that beautiful frill detail. Very spanish vibe, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, it's oh, caught really well. Yeah, yeah, it really, yeah. really, really is. And then you paired it with? And we've actually paired it with this um, simple little clutch bag, as you can see here, from Chenille Shoes, again, in um, Oren Moore. They do have actually heels to match this, but I didn't go with the matching heels today. I wanted to go with something different. Mm. And actually, to note that the shoes are actually Derval's shoes. Um, they're our, our model's own this morning. But I'm loving this because we wanted to bring all the different colour prints that were in this dress that really, really work. And we teamed up, as I said, with Derval's own shoes, which is the orange. I love those shoes, Derval. I'm I know, like, did she ring you up going, do you have a mad pair of orange shoes? But it works really quite well. And of course, as we see here with the lovely dress as well, I'm being V-neck. And I always mention about the bust line. In particular, if you do have a large bust, a V-neck works great. Mm, there we go. It's gorgeous. Okay, we have a guy uh, Thank next. you, Derval. We Sorry, actually yes. do. We can't, wow. our gorgeous David is not long with us. This and is I you, think, babe. Right, so he's, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, he's doing great. And David is actually all the way from Barcelona, actually. Wow. And is with us here in Ireland for the next couple of months. And he's showcasing this morning for Guy Clothing, a fantastic menswear store in Tullamore in Offaly. But again, like that, what do men wear and what can they wear that's going to look really trendy and expensive? And I'm loving this. Yeah, because the pinstripe matches the trousers. It's so you're gorgeous. kind of got a lot going on there. It's we very do, cool. We do have a lot. And it's cool. And a jacket like this, I'm a big fan of any man in a blazer. I think it's sharp. It looks cool. It looks edgy <laughs> in that pinstripe. And yeah. the fact it's actually, you can see it's actually kind of like a denim finish to it. You may not pick that up on the camera, but that's what it actually looks like. It's got, the, it's got the pinstripe, but it's quite casual as it well, is. isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. And you can easily team it with a pair of jeans if you want to. We obviously went with the pants, or with the, with the chino-style pants, and a very unusual kind of a duck egg shade of blue. Yeah, Which nice. I'm like. I think they're beautiful. Yeah, really nice. Do you like yeah. that? Very cool, very yeah. cool. But what about these shoes? Aren't they just, these just fantastic? Little tassel navy, slip-on shoes. I love them. Fabulous quality leather as well, but it just brings the whole thing together, looking really chic and dapper. And again, like that, the colours aren't over mad either. They're quite muted enough. And then a simple shirt with teamed up with as well, a bit of print. Now, if Very Alan nice. was here, he'd be ripping that off, David. He and actually wearing would. It himself, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would. I'm loving that. And Thank all you, from David. Clothing. Fair play to him. Yeah, I think David is slightly traumatised from all those women this morning. David. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he'll forgive us later. This and is a lovely look on this Katie. Gorgeous. And this is actually a sister shop to Guy Clothing. It's cool clothing in Tullamore as well in Offaly and again like that isn't there always something about creams and whites yeah they They're look expensive yep. and this is a, such a reasonable outfit a lovely simple top beautiful sleeving on it and it has kind of a little bit of motifs going on with it that are in the same color on this top as well but it's classy it looks well yeah it looks really really nice again with sort of Trousers. the balloon sleeve yeah. Yeah, and the trousers then itself, as you've mentioned, just a wide leg, simple trousers. And again, like that, in the beige, they just work a multitude. You'll always have them. They go with so many other pieces you already have. Una Healy's clutch, you wrapped Una it up Una Healy's, I wrapped. Una Healy's clutch, gorgeous little sequins, a kind of shimmery um, little clutch bag. And then we also teamed up with these wonderful shoes belonging to Una Healy as well, all from Code in Tullamore. Oh. Aren't they fab? Yeah, I They're wasn't really, really the top dressed. Strap. And it just brings the whole look, giving it that little bit more of a dressier look with the, with the fact that the colours itself are quite neutral. And now, then, the earrings are almost bigger than Katie's head. They're big they, ones. <laughs> they are, and I'm loving these. I think they're actually really beautiful. They're a pearl drop earring from Emily Jean Designs in Galway. But again, like that, it just brings the whole look. Very simple, yet very elegant. And that's what it's about with colour combos. Colour combos Thanks, nailed. Katie. Thank you so much. Well Thank, done. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Manny Manor. Thank you. So Thank you. Much. Lovely. Very good. Very yeah. good. So well, now. Coming up next, Beth Martin Breen is prescribing us the perfect food plan for our pet pooch. Oh, look at that little bean. Back with you in just a few minutes on Ireland AM. You're very welcome back. It is the final part of Ireland AM where we're going to try to make, not make a dog's dinner of talking dogs dog dinners. dinners. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. And walking us through the do's and don'ts of doggy diets is vet Martin Breen. And we've got Liffy here. And we've got Little Beans bean here. here. And Beans going absolutely mad. Okay, listen. 
are we over? People are overfeeding their dogs. Do we have to like do, when we're talking about dog sizes, we've got to feed them proportionally, right? Feed them proportionally. There's there's no set amount for you know for every dog. It'll depend on their their breed, their age, how active they are. You know, if you've got a really active dog running around there all day, you know, out maybe working, then like a springer spaniel, then they're going to need a lot more food than a big old lab that's just sitting on the couch and just mooching around after you. How do we d check kind of our dog is overweight or not? Uh, so when we look at a dog, we look at their body condition score. We're having a, a look at their, their vertebrae here and if it's very visible, and we're looking at a look at the ribs here and if it's very visible, they might be too thin. Um, Liffy's actually perfect weight here. So there's a little bit of cover. I can feel the ribs and I can feel the vertebrae here, but yet I can still see an outline and we've got a waistline here as well. Oh, just okay. like people, you need to be able to see some little bit of a waistline. Some little bit of a waistline. Some bit of a waistline. You've got to be careful what you say, just, yeah. you know. And this is <laughs> this is. Can we talk about these? Are these puppuccinos? These are puppuccinos. What's, uh, a, what's a puppuccino? So it's it's hard to keep up with all the trends that are going. And we do say to people, look, talk to your own vet. If you do see a trend online and you're thinking about introducing some new food or something that's online to your pet, puppuccinos effectively whipped cream. It, it started in America with Starbucks. Yeah, with pop cups and everything. Yeah, so they were doing it as like a secret treat. You could go in and ask for uh, the, the puppuccino. Uh, a lot of the time, look, at it, it's a dairy product. It should be fine. But people might realise where it can get a little bit tricky is if it's a non-dairy product and there's artificial sweeteners, there's a, okay. an ingredient called xylitol, which can be toxic to dogs. And people mightn't realise that. So to be careful with it, you know? Okay. Um, okay. So puppuccinos, like you see all these cafes are trying to get people yeah. in. Like frozen, like you see like frozen ice cream almost as well. I've seen dogs yeah. like licking it, particularly with the hot weather. Uh, look, a lot of dogs will tolerate uh, dairy products, but there are some dogs that are lactose intolerant. And, you know, you could end up with your dog having vomiting diarrhea, you know, passing smelly wind. So you need to figure out, do you want to try it? Talk to your local vet. If, if it's something you want to try, maybe do, just do a very small amount at the start, oh. just in case they have a little bit of reaction. Okay, to it but they the can, like just like cats are kind of lactose intolerant, dogs can be as well. Dogs can be lactose intolerant, yeah. Does it yeah. depend on breed or depend on No, animal? it can be any dog. Okay, it can be so any dog. And then we have to be careful because some dogs can have underlying conditions where if we're giving them dairy products that it may be a little bit higher in fat, it could trigger off didn't they get quite sick? There's a particular condition called pancreatitis. I can see that this is a treat toy. This is a treat toy. Right. Filled with peanut butter. What do you make of these? They're good to distract dogs, but everything in moderation, isn't it? We don't want to give them a, a jar of peanut butter because then we end up either with a sick dog or again, if, if you know, they can be high in fat. But these are very good to distract them. Um, and they particularly can... when people are going back to work or they are exactly. working from home to try and kind of keep the dogs active. Now, of course, Liffy, it'll be too posh and probably... Would you want to sniff of that? Does that smell good? <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a little bit. And because it takes some time to get it out, if they're an anxious dog and they tend to maybe scratch furniture or they're whining a lot when you're leaving, they're good to distract them as you're going out the door. Oh, um, no interest. Pop them one of those little food We cars. have a couple of questions in here from viewers, so we might as well try and see if we can yeah. get through them. My dog always uh, uh, moans when we're having our dinner. He won't stop till I give him some to eat. It, even a small bit of food is is it bad for your dog? A so small, from the dinner table, a small bit is is fine. Again, it's in moderation. But what you're doing is creating a habit there, and dogs are such creatures of habit that they'll then learn if I whine at the dinner table, I'm going to get more treats. So they'll just then sit and beg continuously. So we do advise get better off getting them used to eating in a separate room, yeah. put their food ball somewhere else. A separate room. In separate rooms because. So when you have your dinner in one room. They you, eat at the same time. They, you could, they eat at the same time, but in a oh, different room. Gosh. If you're getting very anxious, you can start off by having the door open between yeah. your oh. room and their room, if possible, and yes. encouraging them by maybe giving them a little treat. Then what about this one? Uh, what, what ingredients should I avoid or look for with dog food? So, again, it'll be depending on your, the age the of the dog because the, the yeah. breed, like, so young pups are going to be faster growing and they're going to need maybe higher protein content to have higher energy consumption than an older dog. Yeah. But, like, things most people will be looking at is the protein content, the fat content, okay. um, the types of, of cereals and, and ingredients that you yeah. use and the type of meat that's, that's being used. In. Um, people are talking about it. I still find it very hot in the evenings. Any advice on when to walk dogs at the minute? Well, Look, we've always said the best time is very early morning or late, late in, the in the evening. And still people do it. I mean, like in the practice a couple of years ago, somebody brought down, come down from Dublin Cavalier and they were excited to be in Ross Lair and brought the dog for a walk midday heat and the dog had an underlying heart condition and came in and really, really like, you oh, know, in difficulty in distress. We got in distress yeah. So is there anything that you would I, say is best for dogs in this heat? Just lots of water? Or? Lots of water. You can add crushed ice cubes to, to, okay. to water. Eight. Put a bit of melon in the, in the fridge. When we talk Eight. about treats and you're trying to get them semi-healthy and not high in sugar or fat, maybe a bit of water, a bit of cucumber. 
Okay. So you can get very oh, fancy. Cucumber. Oh, cucumber. I love that. I love <laughs> the way Lippy's cucumber. looking at this one going, that one won't <laughs> shut up. There. Martin Breen, you're as good as gold. Thank you so much for coming no in. We'll talk to you again up. soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you Liffy. so much. Lippy is available at the moment. Thank now, you, if anybody would like a lovely dog, she's so gorgeous. So or, He's so gorgeous, so but cute so calm. as well. And uh, whereas being here, good mad. luck, whoever's adopted. <laughs> Anyway, coming up on tomorrow's Ireland Down social media star, James Cavanagh is going to be here chatting to us. Yeah, and we've got your usual news, sports, weather. A woman, I think, who's married to an AI chatbot. A chatbot. Talking to her tomorrow. Talk to you then. See you tomorrow. From seven. Bye.